to tonight's program. Uh, I'm Tom Peter at the Dean of the Library. Today is what? Uh, December 8th, 2022, Thursday evening. It might be, it might be people having birthdays tonight. We should have given care. Um, so, uh, Ernie Bedell is our speaker tonight, and what a, what a talented individual. Uh, probably about five years ago, Somehow, I got a copy of this CD, Let the Old Man Play. I can't remember if I bought it or somebody gave it to me. I'm not I'm sure it wasn't a bootleg copy. <laughs> <laughs> or anything, so don't worry about that. But anyway, so I ended up listening to it. I really liked it. I probably listened to it multiple, ten or twelve times. Cool. Uh, Good. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and now he's got a book out. So I got all kinds of props. So uh, he's got a book out now that's... Uh, Selling well. And All right. We've got copies to sell tonight for fifteen dollars, and he'll sign them for you. Um, he recently did a oral history uh, interview with uh, Craig Amison. Craig is somewhere. There he is. Um, that's already up online. So it's yeah. part of our ongoing series of oral histories. And tied to this one is the uh, music venues along Route sixty six, funded in part by the National Park Service. Uh, so. Uh, where we continue to work on that particular project. Um, I do have a, uh, before I get into this, the housekeeping. Um, Black Legends of Springfield Music uh, is a great organization. They've got a Facebook page. They give out scholarships. Uh, Harold McPherson of yes. the Lee Summit yes. in Missouri uh, is one of the leading leaders behind this effort. So. You all know this, but I'll just state the obvious. For our listening audience, uh, years hence, that Springfield, Missouri has an amazingly rich and varied musical heritage that continues yeah. to this day. Um, and black musicians, composers, singers are an integral part of that. Yes. And the entire Ozarks region, I grew up in Northwest Iowa, a nice place, not particularly renowned as a musical hotbed. Northwest Iowa, but the Ozarks are, and so, and it's so varied that it just continues to bond them. Yeah. So, um, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Ernie Bedell from the Bedell family. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. I don't know where to start. There's, there's so much to cover from being born and raised in a family of musicians for years, a hundred years. You say, oh, wow, a hundred years. Yes, a hundred years. It goes back along with my grandmother, her family, minstrels, and early 1900s, late 1800s. Uh, there's a picture of them here on the book. You probably can see it right there. You can imagine from that point on, somebody said, I think it was about two years ago, I was doing a show and a guy came up to me and said, you Ernie Bedell, Bedell family. I said, yeah, uh, I'm Ernie Bedell, Bedell family. Whatever that means, there's a, there's a lot of Bedells. So uh, he said, Y'all been around here a long time. I said, yeah, we've been around here a long time. He said, somebody need to write a book about you. I said, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, that night, it wasn't that funny. <laughs> I, had, I went home, and I was sitting down. I said, wow, this guy asked me something about my family, and uh, I couldn't give him an uh, answer. Uh, that's not good. I thought about it, then, then the more I thought about it, then I said, wow, my family goes back a long way. Oh, I'm 70 years old, so Uncle Dave, uh, great grandpa uh, Grant, oh, then you start multiplying. You said, ooh, 50, 60, oh my goodness, 100, oh, now it's serious. Now the informational side of this, my family had to take some kind of transformation because if 
uh, when you have a family this big, uh, which some of y'all may have a big family, and you know what I'm saying, when you come from a big family, if information don't get transferred down through the years, it get misconstrued or it get lost or it becomes, like I said in the book, it becomes fiction. You have to watch out because in my case, it was my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather didn't pass that much information. So that means my dad and my mom had to transfer any kind of information musically or heritage wise on down to the kids. So coming from a family of 12, I'm in the middle, so there was a lot of information my older brothers and sisters could transfer down to the next half of the family. So the music thing began to take place and from every generation of music, that's how the information began to get transferred. Because as a kid, uh, at the age of eight and nine, that's when the music began to, to become the forefront. Because uh, you wake up early in the morning, and if you was if uh, if you uh, in the fat enough raised on a farm, in which we had a farm in the city, you wake up, you hear chickens, and you hear your grandma, you hear your grandma and your uncle singing and playing piano. Well, that's what we heard. We we had chickens, but we didn't hear the chickens. We heard the piano and grandma singing. So that all of a sudden. That was like, man, this is what this is what this is about. Just wake up in the morning time, go play and listen to grandma and grandpa and grandma and Uncle Lloyd play. Well, you know, after a while, that is that's what's happening. And then my dad played. My brother played. The drums became the the sound of the family. Y'all know Uncle Dave. But my dad played. My uncle Hurley played. It was, it was like, if you didn't play drums, there was something wrong. And, and that's just, that just the way it was, you know. Some families got lawyers. Some families create doctors. Some families create great athletes. My family created musicians, and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the strangest thing about it, as time went by, the family kept on generating musical musicians. It's just like, it's almost like, uh, in the book I state like it's a gene. It's a gene that, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes the gene of hate can go a long ways. Hate can start from this, next thing you know, 100 years later, hate's still going on. Well, can you imagine that gene was a, mu a musical gene? And next thing you know, it's still going strong. It's something that can't be explained. Everybody has it. But just in case in this family, the music gene is predominant. It's something about the human gene that cannot be described. It can't be mimicked or nothing like that. And it's hard to explain, but visually, when you see it, you can say, man, that's some truth to that. You know, it's true to that because um, in our family, there was 12 of us. And we had, there was, <laughs> there was a brother between me and my brother Larry. His name was Dave. So he passed away at, at, at the early, early age of like three weeks but then that's 11. Now out of this 11, there was six, bo six girls and five boys. All the boys were musicians. Just like my grandmother, all of her sons were musicians. Now, that's a coincidence. All my grandmother's sons were drummers and fiddlers. All, all my brothers were drummers and fiddlers. So, you can say, wow, that's a coincidence. But my 
the drummer starts with my Uncle Hurley. A lot of people didn't know my Uncle Hurley taught my Uncle Dave how to play drums. My Uncle Dave is a world-renowned drummer throughout, throughout the United States. Uh, I'm just surprised that the city of Springfield didn't, didn't kind of let the world know, hey, David Dell from Springfield, Missouri. You know, I recognized that when I was traveling in Phoenix, Arizona. It was uh, 76. We was at a music store, Downbeat Magazine, and we opened up the Downbeat Magazine, me and my brother. We said, oh, no, look at this, Uncle Dave. And man, you just don't know what that does to a young man. You know, it's like, what is they keep hope alive? Well, that right there was like a shot of adrenaline without the drugs. You know, man, Uncle David's on Downbeat Magazine. You don't make Downbeat Magazine by being a Rudy Poot drummer. You don't do that. You know, Downbeat Magazine, Buddy Rich, Louis Belson, Ed Shaughnessy. Those then, bam, Uncle David. Wow, man, this is heavy. So therefore, you're like, okay, Uncle David can do it. Damn it, I can do it. So therefore, that's why this had to happen. Because my nephews, my great nephews, they, they, they see this, some of the uncles, hey, Uncle Ernie do it. I can do it. Now, not only the gene, but the visual side of this, once the kids see that it can be done, whew, look out. A kid will take it and they will make sure that they will succeed. Because visually, they seen somebody in the family can do it, I can do it. That is very important. The book is based on that five generations of music and it's still going strong. The fifth generation is doing awesome things. Cameron is doing awesome things in Nashville. He's writing. He's he's gonna be he's gonna be a writer. Just look out for his name. Cameron Bedell. That's my brother's grandson. Uh, my my niece uh, she does choreography. She's a uh, does voice lessons. Her and my sister and has a big studio in Texas. And she does choreography. As a matter of fact, one of the choreography people she done was one of the guys that was in the Grammys. She does the choreography for him. So, but when that's what I'm saying, if the young kids see this possible, you can't stop them. It's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. My, my, my brother Larry said, well, Ern, it took us 100 years. At least, at least they don't have to wait 100. Yeah, I said, yeah, you're right about that, Mac. Yeah, you're right about that, you know. That's, what, that's a good thing. So the book, the book is very important. There's, there's, there's the, the lady I'm talking about. There's Sabretta, and that's my sister, Marshall. They got the big uh, 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 vocal, vocal and a uh, talent agency in te Dallas, Texas. There's Cameron, that's the one that's uh, doing all the writing in Nashville, and of course, uh, that's my dad. My dad, I go back and forth because the story all ties into different sorts, but my dad, in the book I talk about my dad, because my dad died at 50 years old. That's young, I got a son 50. So my dad did not get a chance to really see his sons perform. He seen us perform when we was the fabulous elites, when we was like uh, 14 and 15, and uh, the youngest one was 11. I remember him and my mom be dancing across the, dancing across the floor, but my dad, my dad was uh, no nonsense. I would say the other word, but we're on camera. You know, uh, and y'all know what I'm talking about. 
you know, he was no nonsense. He was he was a drummer. Uh, and if he was going to be in that family and they'd stay in that house, you, you played the drums. Well, I didn't want to be a drummer because there was drummers all over the family. My brother didn't want to be a drummer. Uh, so my dad said, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but y'all need to play drums. So in other words, my dad wasn't too fond of uh, guitar players. Uh, but uh, when we was growing up, my, there was four boys. Like I said, there was five boys. The oldest brother, Tommy, Anthony, a.k.a. Tony, uh, drummer, <laughs> uh, show drummer. We call him show. If you ever look at the old movies of Samus Davis Jr., Buddy Rich, and you know how they be, be playing the drums, doing the solo and stuff, that's what my brother Tommy was like, flashy, you know, real, 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 real flashy, real, real good, you know, and real, real comical, you know. He taught by Uncle David. Uh, he was, he was very influential on us, on us youngest boys. Now he, back then, I mean, in the book, he tells, he told me about the time he was, uh, some of his friends at Central High School. He always wins all the talent shows. He was doing drum solos. They all, oh, here come that big B Dale guy. Here come Tommy B Dale. He's gonna win the, he's gonna win the talent show. Well, yep, Tommy wins it, you know, by drumming, because that's that's what he that's what he done. But uh, my dad didn't buy him drum set. My dad had a snare drum. Again, Springfield. A gentleman by the name of Doc Dasher. Doc Dasher. I thought some of y'all probably hadn't even heard of Doc Dasher. Some of you may have. Doc Dasher was a local product, a writer. Composer, entertainer, from Springfield, Missouri, moved. Doc Dasher was credit, well deserved, but didn't get it. Springfield, shame on Springfield. Uh, he bought my brother his first drum set. My dad wasn't able to buy his first drum set. Doc Dasher bought his first drum set. And he used my dad snare drum, completed the drum set. And that's how he started playing around town. And uh, when he was growing up, he had, like, he had all these pictures of, the, of this white lady on, on the wall. You know, like, God, who's this white lady on the wall? Now, every time I look up, my brother's pasting these pictures of her. Brenda Lee. He was, he was doing shows with Brenda Lee. So that's how Hart, he was recognized throughout the town as being a good drummer. Um, and when it come time for him, there's a story that he told me that um, uh, she was needing a drummer to start doing some shows with her. So he went to ask dad. Well, pop said, boom, shot that down. No, you're not going on the road doing no, beating on drums. And he said, well, he had his reasons. You can imagine back in the, back in the late 50s, uh, a black man going down in Arkansas or Mississippi, uh, playing drums on the country scene, that may not last. That probably was, probably was one of my dad's reasons for not letting him go. But he stayed around town and uh, he played drums, he influenced, the younger brothers, my younger brothers played. That's how I really got started with this band right here called the Fabulous Elites. Another Springfield product that Springfield swept under the rug. Why I get so irritated about that is because this group was an orchestra back in 67 during the segregation in Springfield. 
Just like being in Mississippi, it wasn't no different in Springfield. But we was kids, 11 to 17 years old, kids. The oldest one was 24. That was my brother. He was manager. Now, the 24-year-old managing 11 to 17-year-old kids that was wanted to be musicians. There was 13 of us. Now, can you imagine being 24 and you weren't going to manage these kids? I asked him, what made you think? He said, man, because I seen something, y'all. Y'all were good. Because y'all were serious. Y'all was kids, but y'all were serious. And I, and I thought y'all was worth it. Well, thank you, brother, because the Fabulous Elites was became a product of Springfield, Missouri, that Springfield just swept under the rug at, as though it didn't exist. How can, how can a group so big of so many kids within a, one, a few block area that played music that was overlooked? Uh, didn't matter, you know, but we was overlooked. But we was good. We was good. It was kids. But we was dedicated kids. That's that's why in the book I mentioned that it wasn't it wasn't no joke being being a musician in 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 Springfield in the early in the early mid sixties and being kids from one 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 neighborhood of kids and uh everybody thought it was a joke. Even some of my parents First, when we first started, they thought it was a joke. Well, it wasn't no joke because we carried our equipment from Central High School, cutting through Jerry College to Sherman Street, back to the division and national. We carried our equipment and so our parents finally figured out like, well, maybe these kids are not, maybe they are serious. Well, they come to find out we stayed with it and we start, we start going on the road, going to Pittsburgh, Kansas, Galena, Kansas, uh, uh, Fort Leonard Wood. We did our first LP in the most historical studio, Damon Studio in Kansas City, Missouri. That's what the Fabulous Elites did. And uh, it was so interesting. And once again, my brother Tommy, I gotta give him his props because he made sure we got up and down the highway back safely and and we done that till 72. So from uh, 67 to about 72, um, the Fabulous Elites and hardly nobody knew about this this orchestra. And that was that was very disgusting that that the city overlook the kids we wasn't adults we was kids anything under 17 was kids we, we had a couple of them that got out of high school you know but y'all know yourself just because you get out of high school that don't mean you're grown y'all know y'all know exactly what i'm talking about especially when you had one that was 11 and that was my brother larry he was 11. So you got, you got, you got Tommy, my brother, you got Joe, my other brother, you got me, and then you got my younger brother, Larry, and you got my younger brother, Ronnie, but he was too young. So there was four of us that was playing music. And uh, all the parents of, of these gentlemen, of, the, of these gentlemen, the Fabulous Elites, gave favor to Anthony a.k.a. Tommy, they said, well, we trust you. And they did. Now he's only 24. <laughs> but he done it. He done it. He done it. He, he stayed with us through the good times and the bad times, him and, him and his wife, Esther. He stayed with us. And that generated into the KC Express Band. Now, KC Express Band, was the next product of Springfield, which began to get a little bit 
a notoriety because we had a, a 45 out. But that music stayed in the family that produced the third generation. Now the third generation all all kept on falling down through the music, you know, the third or fourth generation. You know, you, you start thinking about uh, everything that you have learned down through the years, which with your dad, your uncles, your brothers, and all the time that you was watching them, all your nieces and nephews was watching you. So if you want to go out and, and get into trouble, uh, that wasn't wise. That wasn't wise. You know, and back then, uh, one of the guys in the band, Danny Adams, he always says, he always called our parents mama, like Mama Catherine or, or Mama Mary or, or uh, they wouldn't like if y'all do that, you know. No, I don't think I'd be that. I don't think you need to do that, man, because if you, if you go back home and, and they find out you're doing that, oh, man, that, that's not cool. That's not good. There's always somebody that will give you that little nod and say, no, you may not want to do that. That's not good. That's not good. That will ruin your reputation. So even though we was, we was out there playing music, we always felt, an obligation not to make nobody look bad back home. It didn't look good. It didn't look good. You had enough going against you. You didn't want to hit the headlines. Come back up. We knew they was going to do it. All of them all in, in, in jail in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, something like that, you know. And then the first thing you know, the first thing you know when you come back home, who's the first thing you look at? Your mama. Your mama. That was good. That's not good. That, that really wasn't good, you know, because in in our family, um, with with our dad passing early, and all the stuff that your mom went through, uh, you just you just didn't have the guts to come back home and had, and look your mom in the eye and say, "Well, mom, I messed up," you know. You just didn't have the guts. You know, that, and, and, and I think that played a lot of part in, in me and my brothers you know, traveling and playing music. And then, you know, you got a high profile. You got your Uncle Dave, who you totally respect, you know, and he's teaching drums to about 90% of the population that want to be drummers in Springfield. You know, you can't come back home and say you have your nephew sitting in jail or somewhere. <laughs> you know, that don't look good. So we tried to practice, practice, uh, a little respect, you know, respect your family, respect the people, then you, you'd be all right. You know, so that, that was, that was all of this ties in together. Be I say, I keep on saying that because the, the fourth and fifth generation of the Dells and our, our family members, that's all they look at. Some of them said, oh, we remember, we remember y'all, we should watch y'all in the park play. Oh, we remember when y'all played this here. We remember when This Is The Place came out. Ba ba ba. Well, if they remember that, that means, that means you did something halfway right. They don't remember. They didn't say, I remember when y'all was in jail. I remember when, well, they can't say that because that didn't happen. Remember when y'all got busted with 40 pounds of weed? No, you can't say that because that didn't happen. You know, that's, these are things that uh, you, have to, you have to tell when they're young because if they hear it 10 or 15 years later, it'll be all messed up. Wrong names, names will be misspelled, information be wrong, the truth will never see the light because they'll be told wrong because there's some of y'all in here that have been knowing me for a long time. I'm the same person that I was now than I was 50 years ago. I tell it like it is, but I always tell the truth, no matter what it is, the book tells everything about my family. Now don't think I didn't ask the, their permission because I got some sisters in my family that will let you know what's going on. 
And, uh, but they know that their brothers is all about the music, you know, and, and it's just amazing. It kind of shocked them that, that the family tradition is going on this long. And I'm going to tell you something that, that he, he's not going to want me to tell, but I'm going to tell it anyway. A friend of mine, y'all probably know him, his name is Ed Pico. He's a writer for Springfield. And I was over to his house. He was talking about the, uh, some my memoirs and manuscript. And uh, he said, Ern, you know what? He got the count. He said, you got five generations. So I sat up and said, Ed, you're right. That's five generations. Wow. That's, you're right, Ed. You know, it didn't dawn, it dawned on me, but it didn't dawn on me because you never sit down and think about, you know, that's how fast time goes. It goes so fast, you say, oh my goodness. And, you, and then you really start thinking about it when you ask how, you look at, uh-oh, I'm this old. Oh, you might be right, that Michael might be that happening pretty fast. That was, that, that was interesting that, that uh, the music thing has been going on that long. And that's a good thing because I have a great, uh, great nephew now, and he's only about five years old. And now he has just been, he's doing shots with Amazon now. He's, he's want, he he thinks he want to be an actor. But I can't blame him because his, his mom, my sister, is talented, singer, so it doesn't price me none, but it just keeps on going. And that's a good thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just glad that, that the family is able to have music this long and keep on playing. I'm blessed to be playing this long. You know, I am really blessed to be playing this long because my mom used to tell us when we was like in our 30s, my mom says, well, as long as you do, do the right thing, you'll be all right. Just do the right thing. Well, we knew what she was talking about. You know, do the right thing and you and you'll be all right. So we always try to do the right thing. You know, sometimes life don't let you do the right thing. You know, being, being in the music world, it's a cutthroat business. It's... it's it's nothing sweet about, about being in the music world. If you want to say, make a million, there's sacrifices. Some of the sacrifices are not pleasant. You have to roll the dice and say, do I want to take a sacrifice? Yes or no? No, I don't want to take it because it's not right. See, these are, these are some of the things that, uh, some of the lessons that the outside world don't see you know, there is a price to pay. If they say there's a price to pay to start them, yeah, there is. If you want to roll the dice, you can, but it's a price. There's a price to pay. There's nothing, there's nothing cheap. There's, 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 there's a price to everything. Uh, and my, my Uncle David used to always say, he said, well, little buddy, and we just call it little buddy, uh, if, you, if you're going to play, you know, you gotta play it right. You got you, you gotta play it right. You know, play it right. Just he just shake his head. Just play it right. You be all right. So we try to keep that in mind. And as of right now, I I enjoy playing music. I play music with my son with the ABS band. I play jazz with the Arthur Duncan, Arthur Duncan Trio. Uh, my brother's still playing. Uh, Larry's still playing in in Fort. Fort Smith, Arkansas. My brother Joe still writes in Dallas, Texas. So the music is is still going. You know where it's going to lead, where where the sixth generation is going to go. Who knows? It's it's endless, y'all. It's endless, and I'm just I'm just glad to be a part of it because everybody's not fortunate to be from a big family and full of music. Because if you could, you would enjoy. It. You, you really would if you if you come from a big family and there's there's music all the time or entertaining 
it's just like, wow, there's something funny going on at all times growing up. You know, that's just, that just, that just the way it is. It, it always, it's always something to laugh about for growing up. You know, I don't, I don't regret nothing. I don't regret none of it. Would I do it all over again? Yeah. Cause it's in my blood. It's in your blood. You can, you can, you can act like that. It's not there. At 70 years old, I'm still doing it. It's not a coincidence. You know what I mean, Tom? It's not a coincidence. It is what it is, you know. And if I didn't love it, I wouldn't like it. There's something about it that keeps me playing. And I imagine if my Uncle Dave was still living, or if my dad was still living, I think they would still be playing because I seen Uncle David haul drums around at in the mid 80s, not 80, 80, 80 years old. And he still hauling drums around. So uh, I guess, you know, I guess God put, put us up here for a reason. Everybody's here for a reason. We just sometimes we don't even sit down and think about what the reason was. You sitting in that chair for a reason. Everybody's sitting here for a reason, you know. And it's, and it's a blessing just to be sitting here. Yeah, so I'm blessed to be playing music. Uh, at, at times I thought, I'm tired. I don't want to do this no more. Getting on my nerves. And, and next thing I know, hey, man, you want to play this gig? Yeah, I'll play it. <laughs> uh, here we go again, you know. But, but the, book, the book covers a lot, you know, about the family. And, and I think the biggest part of the book that I enjoyed the most as a kid growing up is that I remember we lived next door to my grandma. And my grandma had a screened-in porch. And right across the street from my grandma were my two uncles. So right there, kind of, but they was kind of on the block there a little bit. There was, there was four families. And I remember when Uncle David opened the drum key. And, uh, and there was two drum sets sitting on my grandma's uh, uh, screened-in porch. Well, Uncle David had a drum clinic at the uh, drum key. And he invited, they had a drum duel on my grandma's front porch. Now, being eight or nine years old, oh man, that's a, um, they've got some drummers on grandma's porch. But my older brother Tommy knew who these drummers were. You know, like, God, he was, a, he was, a, he was a, either Buddy Rich, I think I said no, he was Buddy Rich or uh, 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 Max Roach. One of them was at my, having a, him and Uncle Dave was having a uh, a drum clinic on my grandma's front porch. You know, like, oh, wow, man, this is, you know, but being eight, nine years old, you don't think about, you know, it's all well. You're just having a good time watching Uncle Dave and these other guys on grandma's front porch just beating the drums down, you know, like, you never think about it. But, you know, those are, those are things growing up that you remember. And, uh, uh, and once again, when you see it with your own eyes and you hear it and you see somebody you know doing it, I can do it. I can do it. You can do it. I see that, I see that in kids today because I teach at Mark Twain Elementary School. And uh, I watch these little kids and they come up to me and say, uh, Mr. B, we see you on the internet. Well, I hope your mom and daddy show you because there's some things Mr. B be seeing on the internet and playing on the internet. I hope your mom and daddy uh, uh, seen you. <laughs> but it was all good. Don't get me wrong. Yes, yeah, yeah, I'm I'm on the internet. You know, it's fine. So one of the teachers brought it up. You know, uh, and one little girl said, "Mr. B, are you a superstar?" <laughs> I said, "Well, you know, if you want me to be a superstar." I'll be a superstar. You know what? Because you might be a superstar. You say, I can? You sure can. It's just the moments it made me think about the things that they told me. 
So I didn't do nothing but pass the information right on. Do the same thing they told me, I told them. So if it worked on me, it might work on them. That's all life is in, in the music thing. That's the way I looked at it. I remember my family, and that's the way I that's the way I call it. Whatever they told me, I tell them. Maybe to tell the next group of Bedells, tell this next group of Bedells, and the and the chain will never be broken. Maybe who knows next hundred years, there'll be some more Bedells. But at least they know information, knowledge information knowing from which they came because there's a lot of Bedells there's a Dak Bedell sitting back there now you know a brother from another mother you know uh, but you got to know from which you came and the book tells that so if you get a chance buy the book you know read some of the missing things that Springfield didn't know about I tried to write the book about some of the things, some of the people that Springfield omitted. Wow, there's a there's there's young musicians that Springfield like. Oh, a couple of emails came to me and said, oh, there's a there's a guitar player when I was growing up. His name was Joe Rainey, and Joe Rainey was a southpaw, short, kind of stocky. And we used to watch Joe Rainey play in the park when we was kids. You know, Joe would just be down in the park, just be playing. You know, and we thought Joe was the greatest guitar player in the world. But Joe was good. And we thought Joe was, man, Joe's the bomb. In the book, I said, one of my heroes was Joe Rainey. You know, and these are the things that I write in the book. You know, you some things, the system, the town, this sweep under the rug. I didn't want to do that in the book because there's a lot of people that I thought I played with and thought I knew that the town needed to recognize. Joe Rainey was one of them, you know, and there, uh, he meant he he was he was a lot growing up. You know, and there's a lot there's a lot of information about the parents of these kids. So so the book covers a lot about my family. And uh, uh, if you get a chance, purchase the book, you know, because there's, there's some things about uh, per, uh, this man here. Uncle David, I call him Uncle David, you know, Dave Bedell, that a lot of people knew that for his drumming. But he raised beagles, championship beagles. He loved to hunt. He loved to train dogs. They, they thought he was good at drumming. You ought to see him train dogs. <laughs> wow. Uncle David was, man, he had these German shepherds. He walked down and, and bam, he trained them. He walked away. God, man, we thought you was a drummer. You a dog trainer. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that, but these, that's, that's, you know, Uncle David. Was, was sharp, was sharp, was sharp. He, he taught us a lot. Personality-wise, he taught us a lot. He taught us, you see that smile? That's where we got it from. He said, put that smile, he says that smile. If you like, if you don't smile, you, that means you don't like what you're doing. You know, that goes a long way. And the longer you play, you figure it out. Yeah, you know, they, they, they call that personality. Yeah, so. So get the book, enjoy the reading, you know. So uh, the Bedells, we're still in Springfield. So uh, follow ABS band, <laughs> follow us Saturday night, Ernie Biggs, uh, December 10th. Thank you. Take a nap if you need to. Yeah, take a nap so, so just in case you, uh, uh, you get, uh, get home after the news, you know. Uh, 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 you can, you can, you don't feel so bad. You get home at 11, 30, 12 o'clock. You, you can miss the news one night. <laughs> well, thanks very much, Ernie. Uh, questions? So you were like 14, 15 years old. What do you remember about that first recording session? Oh, God. You know, when we walked in there. And what did it feel like to hear it yourself? You know what? Um. 
imagine this many kids, 11, 12 kids, walking into a studio. Kansas City, first, Kansas City, Missouri, is like, oh man, what are we gonna sound like? You know, it was like, you felt like a superstar. And you know, like, but scared. Because this is the first major, you know, studio. Uh, and come to find out, uh, Sig Simon told my brother Tommy, well, Anthony, I keep on calling him Tommy because his name is Anthony, his name is Tony, but Speedy, but he's, <laughs> but he, that's who he is. So y'all, y'all pick the name out. Tony, Anthony, Tommy. He said, they told him, you need to take these kids up to Damon Studios in Kansas City, let him record there. Well, well, you know, you never know at the moment, but as time passed, that was one of the world-renowned studios in Kansas City, Missouri. You know, like, seeing all these names that recorded there, and there, hmm, huh, where are the leaks? But look at all the world-renowned names. So, uh, it was scary, but now that you look back on it, wow, it wasn't too bad after all. Everybody else did that, recorded there uh, at a world-renowned studio that's go down in history. So it was a little scary, but it it was it was fun because we didn't that that was like some a big road trip, recording. Yeah, that was fun, scary but fun. Uh-huh. The next show would be January the 14th at uh, Galloway Station on Republic Road. Nine o'clock, do I have to take a nap? <laughs> nah, that's right, Tom. You sure do, buddy. You know the deal. You're exactly right. So I'm just an Iowa boy and, and uh, you know, just trying to learn the musical tradition. For some reason, I, I, I've got a theory, but uh, Bebop Brown, just, I don't know, i got to learn more about Bebop Brown. Um. <laughs> Springfield, swept on the rug. Bebop Brown. Brother Brown, that's what the fellas in the, in the band call him. In the book, his son, Jairus Brown, used to play with us. A lot of people didn't know that Bob had a son that played alto. You know, Bob, Bob helped us out as kids, gave us a place to play. Uh, him and Milt Adams done when nobody else didn't want to roll the dice with us. Didn't want, didn't, didn't, didn't think about passed along information. Uh, I was like, 14, my brother was 10, and my, and my uh, kid brother Richard Allen, it was, he was 13. So there was three of us. Bebop Brown had uh, a club. It wasn't really a club, they called it a juke joint down on Summit and Central Street. And we was in the back. Uh, wasn't supposed to be there. We was in the back of the club, and in the back of, there was a screen door, and the screen door you could see inside of the joint. We didn't go in. We was kids. We was in the back, in the back, and when he got done, Bob came out there in the back. We call him Bob. He came out the back. He said, in the book, I tell this story. He said, little B, I know who you are. He said, y'all not supposed to be back here. We was kids. We wasn't supposed to be back there at all at 9.30 at night to begin with. <laughs> and uh, he said, "If y'all stay back here and listen. I know who y'all are. He know that, he know that we, was, we was in this little band called the Fabulous Elites. He said, y'all stay back here. 
and we stayed back there and we listened to Bop play. That was the first time I heard the tune called Red Top. Was that, and that never forgot it the rest of my life. And the next time that we came to practice, the first time, the first song we wanted to play, let's play Red Top. <laughs> Bebop. Bebop could have told us, get out of here. Y'all too little. Y'all had no business down here in the alley listening to music. But he didn't say that. He said, y'all stay back here. Don't be back here long. Stay back here and listen, but don't be back here long. We stay back, we stay back there. We didn't stay long, we done what he said, and we left. I remember that so vividly, and, and we used to watch Bob play in the Spill Spring Park for Park Day events. And then what topped it off, uh, I had the chance to play with him in church. And that, that just like, man, you know, it's, it's a connection that you just, you just don't forget, you know. But he's, he's the man, as we say. He's the man. Yeah, me, Bob Brown. Yeah. Did you ever get to play with uh, Mr. Brown and Dallas Bartley? Dallas Bartley. I never had played with Dallas Bartley, but he was my mentor. He lives next door to my Uncle David. And... Dallas Bartley, Uncle David, Bebop, they had, they didn't know our names. They didn't know our names because they knew there was four of us playing. They didn't know our names. They all called, hey, Little B. They knew who we were. So they just, they just cut it off at Little B. And we answered to that. And Dallas Bartley, like I said, he lived next door. So I, I watched Dallas Bartley. I watched him when he played. He played, a, he played electric bass, and he played the upright. And I always uh, asked him uh, what to do. And he said, keep on practicing, little B. Keep on practicing. I said, okay. And that's, i never forget that, because that was easy. Cause he, and I watched him tote that equipment around, you know, live next door to Uncle David. And then the older I got, I, I finally realized on his reputation, woo, the man. <laughs> yeah, he's, he was the man, you know, and, and we, we used to, we used to uh, uh, imitate him. We used to imitate, <laughs> we used to imitate him, Bob, Uncle Dave, mimic him all the time, you know. He'd kick the leg up when he, when he plays and, 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 and my Uncle David be playing, and, and he, uh, he'll point the stick at you and start, and start laughing, and, and, and Bebop will always do a little gesture, and we used to go home and we used to mimic all these gestures that, that they done, but you know what? Every time you perform, the first thing you want to do is want to be them. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, when you see somebody do it, and you know them, again, when you see somebody do it and you know them, you want to be like them. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you got to start somewhere, you know, and why not start from the best and want to be the best? So it's, yeah, Dallas Bartley is the man, always will be, you know. I don't mind patting myself after him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.